we don't sleep very much um trying desperately to save her life because we know that wherever she is she is not safe and we have to get to her time is running out did um so when she went to work to, to work like normal that morning how did you find out something was wrong i didn't the first day she was gone um i went to bed early that saturday i went to bed around 7 30 um, I was exhausted, and um, she gets home around 8.15, 8.30 on a normal day, and it wasn't really that weird for us to not cross paths for one day, you know. It also wasn't that weird for us to not check in with each other for, for a 24-hour period, you know. And when I texted her, I texted her once or twice on Sunday, but I assumed she was at work because I woke up after 5 a.m. when she would be leaving. Um, and, you know, nothing was amiss physically. There was, no, there was no reason for me to believe that anything was wrong. Um, she wasn't answering my text messages. I tried to call her um, when she... Because I had a couple things I wanted to talk to her. I actually... Um, my girlfriend and I planted some trees that Sunday and I was really excited about it and I really wanted to show her and um, I had a flashlight out ready to go and I was kind of waiting for her to come home and uh, when 830 rolled around and she didn't show up you know I was trying to call her and everything like that and no response and my girlfriend convinced me that you know something was definitely wrong I wasn't sure. I thought maybe she was just, you know, doing an 18-year-old girl thing. I don't know, I, you know, but she'd never done anything like this before. Is it a factory? Yeah, it's a, yeah, she was part of the battery manufacturing process. Okay, so she would go to the Walmart to get the shuttle, is that right? That's right. Is that, so that was like a normal thing early in the morning? Yep, and she did that every day she worked. She never, she never drove to the factory you know, herself. She would always drive to the Walmart, catch the shuttle. Um, was there anything unusual about that morning? I mean, were, do you, were you sleeping at that time? When she yeah, left? I was asleep when she left for work. I, the last time I spoke to Naomi was the night before that, um, when she was getting ready for bed. She actually left the dome light on in her car. I noticed it, I came home around 8.20 and uh, noticed the dome light was on in her car and she was getting ready to lay down. I was like, hey, Naomi, dome light's on your car. You better go turn it off. And she said, why don't you turn it off? <laughs> you know, like an 18-year-old sister might. And, um, and I told her, I don't have the keys to your car. Aren't your doors locked? She said, no. I was like, why don't you lock your doors? And, you know, big brother lecture. And she, she sighed and rolled her eyes and stormed out and turned off her dome light and I and she comes back inside I was like did you lock your doors she said oh. you know just like that that kind of thing so mom agreed that something was wrong and she hadn't heard from Naomi since Friday either mm -hmm. so this is extremely weird um, our father also you know felt the same way we didn't know what was going on, so I called the police and tried to file a missing persons report. Um, the deputy never came. Uh, he did call me, and he basically said, you know, this isn't enough, you know, to file a missing persons report on an adult. And um, said to call him again tomorrow, you know, the, on Monday. And so I started going on social media and asking, has anybody heard from Naomi? Did you, when was the last time you were Snapchatting or anything with her? You know, and, and then I heard back from a few kids that they're like, it was last time was early Saturday morning. And then I sent her other messages and she never opened them. I thought she just left me unread because I, I don't know why. I was like, what? Wait. She always opens her messages. Always. So... Monday comes around, I go to work like normal. That's actually the last time I was at work. It was Monday the 14th. 
and <clears throat> Hervé, our father, um, he looked at, because he has access to Naomi's bank account. So he looked at that and there had been zero activity since five o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Um, and she had stopped at a gas station around here that was on her way to work, uh, mm -hmm. buying some snacks, energy drinks, whatever she wanted, and going on to the Walmart parking lot, presumably, right? So we could confirm that that happened. We reached out to Panasonic HR and they were able to call me as her emergency contact and let me know that she was no call, no show Saturday and Sunday. We got to Walmart around 7.30. They were busy, maybe about 8, 8.30. We got Walmart security to help us look on their footage from that day. And uh, first thing that I saw, which was a little relieving to me was seeing her car arrive at the plate at the area that she usually parks at and uh sitting there and then all of a sudden and i mean it's low resolution it's from a distance everything like that not zoomed in or anything and all you can see is like like at first all we saw was like a little bit of movement and then the car drives away and uh, so we didn't know what happened, so we, we were able to kind of zoom in and look at it, and um, then we saw this man approach from behind the car, uh, open the driver door, which based on conversations I've had with Naomi, uh, was probably unlocked, and <clears throat> say or do something to her to make her move over and cool as a cucumber, drive the car away, no fast accelerations, no, st no fast stopping, anything like that. And um, that was confusing to us, but I called it in as a kidnapping immediately. I only saw the creepy part with the, the man walking up and down the sidewalk. And then when he turns and he squares his shoulders and he's staring at her car, Oh, I got such chills. It was like that moment when a lion spots its prey and is about to pounce. It's chilling. Because you know what's going to happen next. I know what happens after that. And it's horrible. And this is after you had already called the day before. Exactly, yeah. Um, so at 9 a.m., I, I was out looking for Naomi. You know, I had called in to work. Um, and I was a little frantic and I was driving around uh, these desert areas r right over here um, between Highway 50 and I-80 and I was looking around all that stuff to try to see if I could find her car and um, I didn't but that same day Lyon County found her car in a place that was so obvious and so out in the open that I never thought to look there. You know, right, right in front of the Sherwin-Williams plant, just to the east of it, between the loading dock road that goes to the polyglass plant and the Sherwin-Williams Sherwin fence is a small little dirt pullout where semis park sometimes. And her car was there. And you can see that from I-80. Like, thousands of people must have seen that car. And uh, what goes through my head is, you know, if this case had been taken seriously from the beginning, um, maybe we would have found that earlier. In fact, I know that we would have. And uh, since then, I mean, it's been one thing after another, and we, don't, we still don't have her. And I know they didn't give details, but it was something with the car, it seems like, that made them take it more seriously. I don't know what yeah. that was. I was sitting there. So when they found the car, I actually knew before they called me because somebody posted it on social media that there was like some uh, police activity there. And I was on the way already when the detective called me. And I sat there for almost four hours, pretty much like biting my nails 
and waiting because it took them that long to open the trunk up because I was afraid that, you know, we might see Naomi in the trunk. So, um, that was excruciating. And honestly, that feeling hasn't left. You live in South Africa. Yes. And Naomi lived in South Africa yes. with you before moving with her yes. brother. She lived with us there for two years. She went to the American International School of Johannesburg, and she graduated high school there. So Naomi was used to sort of a, would you say, like a sheltered life in some ways? Or we a are life? very protected. We, ha we live in a very secure compound with 12-foot walls with razor wire that's electrified on top. We have armed guard at our gate. Everybody has to show ID in order to get in. All of our all of our windows and doors have, you know, steel bars and grills. And we have a security system, emergency panic buttons in every room. Um, yeah, we're very well protected in South Africa. And so. that's how she grew up, sort that's, of in other countries too. With in Germany, not so much because it's very safe there. So the freedom of movement that she had there was very special. But in Moscow, it was also. You know, we were also very well protected there as well because of the environment. She wanted to make life here in, in the United States after growing up overseas. And so she decided to, that, well, we all decided that um, it would be best if she came and started her American adulthood as an independent American young woman right here in Fernley, Nevada. And so she moved in with you. That's right. And how long ago was that? August of 2021. Okay. And how was it going? And was she enjoying? Things were going great. Uh, she has her own car, has a job. Uh, she was saving up money uh, in order to get her own place. And, um, and she, like I said, she's a very independence-minded woman. And uh, she really wanted to live on her. She really wants to live on her own, and um, and do her own thing, you know. And then you flew here. Getting here and reuniting with the family was. I can't say that it was amazing, but the feeling of being together with everyone was comforting. You know, being able to put my arms around my, my two older kids and being able to put my arm around my son and tell him the first thing I whispered in his ear was, I don't blame you. This is not your fault. Please don't feel guilty and told him how much I loved him and how proud I am of him. Because I could see in his eyes that he was killing himself with guilt and look, he still is. And, um... Then we, we started um, the social media campaign. My daughter is a social media queen. She knows what to do. And uh, because we are trying to push this story to get Naomi home safe. That has been our focus 100% of every waking moment, which has been a lot of waking moments, middle of the night. We don't sleep very much. Um, trying desperately to save her life. Because we know that wherever she is, she is not safe. We have to get to her. Time is running out. I mean, what's your message? I mean, there have been other cases that have been solved based on just someone looking back at their video. Right. Well, I guess my message is first to the people local here, or the people that have driven through here in the past two weeks. Um, if your dash cam footage is still there, um, it would mean the world to this family if you could help save a girl's life and look through it. Just just to see if you see my sister's car for those first three days or if you see the truck for any period of time in the past month even because, you know, criminals stake places out. They pick places to go. Um, so any any type of activity with those two vehicles uh, it would help a lot. So, um, people watching this, I, I, it, it seems like they could still have information about where his truck was mm -hmm. from the 
time that Naomi went missing to when they arrested him. I mean, it seems like there's still a lot that people could help with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely, you know, we need to figure out where he went in Naomi's car. We need to figure out, um, you know, what happened. Um, and we need to figure out where she is. And we need to bring her home. Number one thing is we need to bring Naomi home. I don't care about any of this other stuff. I don't care about prosecution. I don't care about Troy Driver. I don't care about any of that. We just want Naomi back, period. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. You're I welcome. I appreciate it. I know it's not easy probably to, to relive it over and over again. but I will do whatever it takes to find my girl. I don't, and I don't care about how much it hurts me. That's not important. I'm not important. Naomi is important. She's a shining light in this world, and this world needs her in it. We need her.